I have the honor to announce the next talk. And it's going to be by a person who has seen so many NEOS projects and touched so much of the code that I'm inclined to say that he really has seen almost all of the problems that you can encounter in a NEOS project. He's the co-founder of Flownative and the DJ of the NEOS Slack playlist. Please welcome on stage Christian Müller. This is uh, wrong, obviously. No, it's right. All right, cool. Well, you know the next slide then. So, um, the F files. Um, recently, I discovered that a secret group called Flonative um, did a three-year investigation into a mysterious life form that appeared on this planet. Uh, it calls itself NEOS, and it's uh, still pretty elusive, but um, apparently it's, uh, uh, it does strange things sometimes, and uh, we tried to figure out what is happening there. And um, yeah, I got my hands on those, uh, on those files, uh, I ripped them out of the Flow Native vault, and um, they somehow managed to, in a three-year investigation, uh, look through over a thousand files, actually, a thousand incidents uh, that were reported all over the world um, that somehow seemed to be related with this NEOS thing. And um, I looked at the raw data, so I actually looked at uh, over a thousand tickets uh, to get conclusions out of what this uh, group did there in the three years. And um, to me, it seems they wanted to keep it under the wraps because it was so mysterious and uh, so strange to some people that uh, it couldn't be released to the world. But I'm doing this now to you. You are the first people to see this. And yeah, let's get started with uh, the obvious theme music that I cannot, cannot play for legal reasons because another famous investigative team used it already and we couldn't procure the license for it. Um, obviously, thank you. <laughs> obviously, um, NEOS demands a lot of control. So users of NEOS that get in touch with this thing um, are advised to use version control uh, when dealing with it because it increases the likelihood of uh, repairing damage that appeared over time when working with NEOS because uh, you can go back in history, you can understand what happened over time in your project. And um, Git is just one example of uh, version control, but it's the prime example. It works very well with the Composer and with NEOS altogether. So I really recommend that you all base uh, your NEOS incidents on Git. Uh, you can use GitHub, but at least uh, get familiar with GitHub because a lot of incidents happen on GitHub and a lot of stuff around NEOS happens on GitHub, so you want to know how it works and uh, get in touch with the, the, the little Octocad, which is a strange phenomenon on itself, so, but that is for another talk. Um, yeah, so really, really, really use version control. If you don't use version control right now, please use it in every single project, regardless how small it is. It benefits not only you, but whoever you call to fix anything that you need to get fixed, uh, they will be super happy if they just get a Git repository uh, because it makes it much easier to understand what's happening in your project. Right, and then we heard um, this thing is very strict in code. Um, you cannot just write any code in with NEOS. You have to, to stick to some standards, otherwise it, it might complain later on. And uh, so uh, there's a, an external researcher group that looks at uh, strange phenomena and code uh, practices, and they came up with uh, two very specific um, guidelines how to 
um, structure code for mysterious code uh, um, thingies. So PSR1 and PSR2 are very well recommended for your projects because uh, they they let everyone understand how the code looks like uh, because all the code will look the same. If you don't like PSR1 and PSR2, I also don't like some of the parts of it, but at least it's a standard and I know it works and we use it in the project. But if you don't want to use those, use any other coding guideline, but please use a coding guideline and stick to it and repair the code you have already uh, to stick to the guideline. Uh, otherwise, it's just a mess and everyone looking at the code later on will uh, not understand a, th a thing. That is number two, also uh, something I took away from the raw data. Um, then there's a lot of, of records in this NEOS thing. And um, it tries to um, separate stuff into different contexts. The word context is actually used a lot uh, when you deal with, with the NEOS uh, uh, phenomenon. And it's, it's uh, quite interesting because it, it seems to be used as a device to um, make communication about it more difficult because uh, there are so subtle differences in the context and where they are used in different contexts. So you never know what's happening if you're not very precise with your language and understand what different contexts are for. Um, you will not deal with uh, a NEOS correctly if you don't know your context. So let's have a look at that so you are prepared if you ever have to deal with one of those NEOSes. Uh, first, there's the application context, the so-called application context. It's a very low-level device to uh, configure your NEOS uh, to behave in a specific way. So um, you set it via environment variable flow context, and um, by default, it's in development context. So huh, I'm one slide behind. Very interesting. Um <laughs> Um, so, you actually decide between development and production environments for your NEOS. Uh, in, devel in development, your NEOS will be a bit more sluggish, but also it will uh, behave much more friendly towards changes and modifications to it. So, um, while, you while you work closely with your NEOS, um, please run it in development context. Uh, it makes things much easier and you won't have so many strange side effects uh, when you change something and nothing happens. Um, so stick to development context while you actually develop on it. Uh, there's another context, it's called production. And production is obviously if your NEOS is finished and you want to present it to the world. So at that point, you should switch to uh, the production context because that makes things much faster, um, even though changes will not, uh, not be propagated into the system anymore that much. So please decide when to use which context. Um, just for reference, there's a third context I read about. It's called testing. and it the name says it all, it's for testing, so please never use it unless you actually test something. Um, it should be used automatically while testing uh, your private NEOS. Um, you can nest context, that's a pretty important feature. Um, so you can have subcontext in development or in production to prepare different settings for whatever you come up with, different machines or different environments, um, different developer uh, uh, machines, different API keys, whatever you need. Um, use subcontext for this. It helps a lot to structure your configuration and um, to let different people and different machines run uh, the same NEOS uh, instance, basically. Right, that is the application context, very low level, but you need to know it. And by the way, if you never configure anything, uh, consider that your application runs in development context. So um, latest, when you put it to some live server, you want to configure something about it. Right, then we have the security context. The name says it all, it's all about the security. Uh, you want to know this because uh, security around NEOS is pretty important. Um, as with any uh, mysterious uh, thing in the world, you want to have it secured and not spreading somewhere wildly. 
Um, so the security context is a device used uh, to get information about authenticated accounts and roles, uh, all kinds of stuff in that area. So um, if you need that anywhere, you could use the security context, um, but it's a speci pretty specific uh, thing. So you might, uh, you might try to avoid it and just use uh, policies, uh, which we talk later about, to get going. Right. Uh, then we have the context that you probably all mostly work with, uh, which is the node context. Um, every single node that appears uh, within a NEOS is um, bound to a specific context. And the context um, declares several important informations about um, what your node actually is and where it is visible. So visibility is the first thing that is part of the context information, the node context information. Um, the workspace is part of that node context. And obviously dimensions are part of the node context. Mm -hmm. So all these things are defined in a node context and uh, we saw a lot of projects um, uh, where that was not clear. So a node always has a context and um, the context really defines where it is visible. So um, always look out for the context. Um, you can ask every node for its context and that will obviously be different even though you s might see the same thing. So um, if you have a node and you see it in the front end and in the back end and you never touched it, it still has a different context because once you see it in the front end, in live context, uh, in live workspace, and once you see it in the back end in your user workspace, uh, it is technically still a different node with a different context, but um, you see the same thing. So be aware that uh, context is really important to understand where your node comes from and why it is like it is. Um, we will have a look at how to work with the context a bit later on, at least shortly. And um, you can always manipulate the content, but uh, the context, but again, be very careful with that uh, because there can be strange side effects doing that. Usually this is figured out automatically and you don't need to care, but um, you should know it is there and what it contains and why you want to touch or not touch it, more or less. Right, and then we have in NEOS, obviously, when you work with nodes, you want to render them in some way. You want to produce HTML, you want to produce an API, anything else. So um, your NEOS usually has a Fusion engine running. And um, this Fusion engine also has a context. Um, the Context in Fusion is uh, the variables in the rendering stack at the current point in time. So um, if you look at Fusion code, uh, you will see it's a nested construct. So you start at, at the top at the root matcher and then you go down, you render some page and then you render some body and then you render some content. And in that content, maybe another content. And um, all along there is a, um, a context, a stack, so um, variables might be uh, added to the stack, might be changed in the stack, um, and that is the fusion context, which you never actually touch. That's very important. You, you, y we will see how you touch it, but technically you never access the uh, fusion context, and um, it is just there in the background. You might work with it and need it if you actually want to implement your own uh, fusion uh, implementations and fusion objects. At that point, you have rare, uh, raw access to the fusion context and can manipulate it. But you need to understand how it works um, because uh, if you manipulate it, you should reset it back to whatever it was um, before getting uh, giving up control back to the fusion engine. So. Um there's another context. We have a lot of contexts. There's probably more contexts. I forgot something, but there's so many contexts. Uh, that is enough. The last one is the eel context. And the eel context are basically just variables available in any eel expression. And now that is how 
the Fusion context gets to you because whenever you use an eel expression in Fusion, uh, you will actually get, as part of the Fusion uh, context, uh, as part of the eel context, you will get the Fusion stack of variables available at that point in time. You will get more. The eel, co the eel context contains more than the, the Fusion context at any point in time because, for example, you have helper variables that are also available in eel but not in the Fusion context. Um, but it's, uh, it's exactly what you have in the Fusion context available in your eel context at any given point in time. That's important to remember. So all the variables you have available in eel, node, document node, uh, site, uh, all that is actually in the Fusion context and passed down while rendering your Fusion. And then whenever you use an expression, uh, Fusion will give it to, um, to uh, eel. Right, that is all about uh, context that you need to know, hopefully. Um, remember it, uh, look it up if you need to, but there are, there are very big differences between the context, especially the application security and node context are very different constructs for very different uh, uh, things. So please um, make sure you, you know what you're talking about and don't accidentally try to render fusion with a security context because that will not work out well. Um, right. So the next thing is, again, something I saw a lot in those files I scanned. Um, Composer and Packages are two very neat tools. And um, actually, Composer is pretty much the standard for um, accessing packages in PHP and you should definitely use it. Um, we don't officially provide any um, package uh, releases anymore, I think, I hope. Um, so you should install your, ac your current NEOS installations via Composer anyway. Uh, if you don't, please do it, uh, because it's, it's actually uh, pretty good and it works well and it helps you a lot and it also helps anyone supporting your project a lot to understand which versions you have installed in your installation. Additionally, um, Composer will generate a log file that contains the currently installed versions of all the packages in your system. So once you update it to a given version and it works, you should please save your composer log file, which means you should version it to the git together with the rest of your code. So whoever comes in, checks out the code, can run composer install and get exactly the versions that you had and therefore should have a running system because you tested those versions and they worked at some point in time. So um, unless they have a totally different system, that should work and it's super helpful to get up and running quickly and not have five developers with five super different uh, versions of NEOS running for the same project, uh, which then leads to very strange problems sometimes. Um, small note, be aware that um, Composer will, if you com compose update, it will use the PHP version that you have at, um, at that time um, to find out which dependencies it should install. Um, which means some of the dependencies uh, have different versions for PHP, I don't know, 7.1, 7.2. So if you install or if you update with 7.2, the log file will contain a version that might only work with 7.2. Uh, so if someone then comes in, uses the log file and has 7.1, that will fail. Um, that is the one trick that you need to be aware of. Um, so uh, if something happens, some error messages, it's usually that. Um, there is no super great way besides having the same PHP version on all the s development uh, machines. There is. <laughs> yes, you can do that. Obviously, that is the nice way to do it. And I would have told you next, but yes. That is that is the way to do it. Thanks. Um, so yeah, there there are ways to do it, and that's that's the way. Um, ask ask him to to explain it to you. Um, so yeah, please use Composer. I mean, that's the base idea. It it works really well, and it it helps anyone accessing your code to understand what's happening. 
and actually please use it also uh, with your own packages. Um, there's currently a practice that we actually uh, started with to uh, create a bunch of packages for a project and then uh, put everything in Git together and just install the rest of the packages via Composer. That's uh, pretty neat, but it has some drawbacks because Composer doesn't know about all the packages that you have in your local installation um, because it never installed them. They, just, they are just there, right? I mean, you just access code that is there by accident. Um, from Composer's point of view, this doesn't exist. And that's obviously a problem because any dependency declared in those projects, uh, in those packages, uh, will never reach Composer, uh, which means you will ha have to duplicate them to your root Composer JSON, uh, and then you have duplication which you don't want to have. So um, there are ways to do that. Uh, local packages, uh, you can actually tell Composer that, oh, look here, there in this folder, there are packages for you available, and if you Composer update, you can use them from there, uh, so you can require them in your root Composer JSON. So you can actually say, uh, oh, look, Composer, I have some packages here in a local package folder, and um, I require them in my Composer JSON, my root Composer JSON, and it will install them via Composer into, via symlink into the actual packages folder, uh, use them, NEOS will work with that, and all the dependencies in those packages will be resolved uh, correctly. Um, so that's a pretty neat way. There's examples on GitHub. I can share the link later. Um, I don't like putting links in presentations because then you all take pictures and need to uh, type it from the picture, that doesn't make sense, so uh, I will just share it via Twitter later. Um, but uh, this works pretty well. Um, I like to, to work with that recently, and um, it, it really helps to do everything with Composer at that point. Um, then the other thing is, obviously, um, Composer has a nice package repository with packages. Um, use it, it's there for you. I mean, there's a whole lot of packages out there and some are really, really good and well-made and you don't need to reinvent the wheel to do standard stuff. Um, Neos and Flow works pretty well with external code. There's no problem to install some uh, third-party PHP code and use it in your Neos installation. And um, one of the things I want to highlight is the PHP leak, which I personally really like. Um, it's a community that produces high-quality PHP packages for very specific use cases. Uh, there's a wonderful CSV package in there. If you ever had to deal with CSV files, uh, you want to have that package because it helps a lot. Uh, but all kinds of small packages are in there. They are all well-made. They work pretty well, and um, you should have a look at that. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff out there, but those, uh, those people are really, really neat. Um, right. Um, so, if you have all, the, all this, apparently according to the files I looked at, you're on a pretty good track and um, a lot of things should go well and in order. Um, but once in a while there are some other interesting things happening. For example, um, a package order is, is something that sometimes uh, goes massively wrong and then you wonder why something is not working. Um, the thing is, package order for Composer is totally not important, but for Flow and Neos it is, because uh, we allow you to put your configuration in all the packages, so you can put the configuration where it belongs to the code that uses it. This is pretty neat from a developer point of view, but from a framework point of view, it's super annoying because you have to look at all the packages and find the, the configuration and then merge it somehow. And that's the problem. We, we need to merge all the configurations. And now, in which order should we do that? Uh, we don't know. So um, what we do is we try to order your packages. We, we try to order all the packages in, in your installation. And we do that by dependency. So if you require another package, we think, well, if you depend on the code, um, and so Composer would install that package you depend on first before installing your package, we also think you might depend on the configuration of that package, so we load the configuration of that package before your package. Um, and that is something to keep in mind. 
Um, if you have the feeling that some of your configuration is not applied, that might be a missing dependency in one of your packages. Um, if you declare that dependency, um, do a package rescan, we will detect the change in dependencies, reorder the packages, and then uh, your configuration might apply because now it's loaded after something else and um, the merging works correctly. Um, that's especially interesting for stuff like dimension configuration because the default dimension configuration is just empty. So if your dimension configuration is applied first and then the default, you have empty dimensions. Why? Because I configured something here. So what is happening? It's probably a package order and it's super simple to solve. Uh, just keep in mind that package order is important in configuration and if something with your configuration doesn't work, check if the package order is correct. Um, Package list will can tell you the order that Neos will load the stuff, so you can compare if that is the correct order. So that is uh, just something to keep in mind that can drive someone crazy if they don't think about um, that it might happen. Good. If you have solved that, you're again on a pretty good track. But there's one important thing missing. Um, you have your beautiful Neos, you hatched it, you nurtured it, uh, you have it under control, you have it secure, um, but now you want to show it off to the world. So you need to deploy it somewhere. And um, there are several tools to deploy stuff. And one of them is Deployer that I worked with lately a lot. It's a generic PHP deployment tool. Um, it's basically just a task runner. Uh, you can write some PHP code to decide what happens when. Um, super nice to use. So that's a straightforward way to get something running. And if you then, then want to go a step further, you uh, put some CI server around like Travis and you have a pretty neat pipeline to um, get your Neos out to the world um, pretty frequently. Uh, Surf is another tool works also uh, quite well. I haven't used it for a while, but I think you can still use it uh, to deploy <laughs> Flow Neos uh, somehow. Um, and if you don't want to have all the hassle about deployment and stuff, um, you, can, you can leave that uh, apparently to the researcher group themselves um, because they have a Flow Native Beach um, that does all the deployment stuff as well. So um, you don't need to take care because they apparently have a lot of ideas about how to take care of a Neos in, in a good way and um, will deploy it for you. <sighs> Now you have deployed your Neos and it's it's working pretty smoothly. It's um, actually everything is fine, right? At this point, we are done. But then you you're showing off your Neos and people complain about things. So um, the next incident that was uh, that was that was looked at in those Neos files that led um, deep into a forest and. Um, in that forest, apparently, the researcher group of the F-Files uh, found a hidden cache. And <laughs> they discovered that uh, hidden in there was a note about something called Redis. Uh, it's an alien artifact that you can install on servers that will apparently um, push your Nears to be more energetic and uh, more straightforward with its answers. So uh, it's pretty neat. Um, actually, caches are very important for Nears, especially in production. So um, whatever you use, you don't need to use Redis. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, cache implementations. We took a pretty conservative route in the default configuration. Everything is cached to the file system, so it very much depends on the speed of your file system, how fast your Neos will be. And also, uh, the bigger the installation, the more cache entries, the worse it will, it will work, uh, obviously, because, I mean, file system doesn't really scale that well with many entries. Um, so latest at that point, you want to use something else than the file system. So look at the cache configuration. Basically, in any Neos installation, always look at the cache configuration. You don't need to have a Redis. Uh, you can try to use your MySQL database. Depending on how it's installed, it might be faster than, than the file cache. Um, but that's up to you to decide. We didn't want to take that decision for you. So 
um, have a look at that. There's also other backends memcached uh, that you can use and all of them will definitely improve the performance of your NEOS. So uh, you should have a look at that. Um, this, uh, this hidden cache thing is uh, quite important. Uh, next up, um, I had uh, a bunch of files that dealt with uh, several, uh, several things that happened in a fusion kitchen. Um, there are uh, some mysterious things happening in uh, in the fusion kitchen, so uh, we should have a quick look at what what is going on in in fusion. Um, fusion arrays is one important point that especially is difficult for beginners. Um, if you have worked with fusion, you you know there's uh, there's different fusion prototypes that you can use in your in your fusion code, and um, the, the, the naming is, uh, is usually pretty obvious. You have something like a Neos Fusion tag. What does it do? It outputs a tag, an HTML tag or XML tag. Um, that's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, okay, a tag, thanks. I know what it is. Um, but then you have something like the Neos Fusion array. And I go in there and think, yeah, well, it's an array. What else? I mean, it will output an array. Right? I can I can iterate over it. I have an array. It's it's cool. Um, but then sadly you realize it's not an array. But what you get is a very long string of things. And if you look into that, uh, what you will realize is that uh, what Neos does with the Neos Fusion array is uh, it takes all the entries in this array, renders them, and puts together a string from them and gives you the string. That's uh, pretty disappointing at first. Uh, the reason ha is legacy, 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 because at some point that naming kind of made sense for some people, so it was chosen. And obviously it's a pretty integral part of uh, Fusion, so we don't change it at the current point because it will break a lot. Um, but to offer you the possibility of actually creating an array in Fusion, uh, we have the Neos Fusion raw array that actually gives you an array. Um, apart from that, it works the same. It just outputs an array in the end. So uh, keep that in mind. There's raw array and array. Um, there's also collection and raw collection, kind of the same deal there. Um, at least there's some consist consistency in the inconsistency. So um, uh, just keep it in mind uh, if you have strange, uh, strange effects with the uh, arrays and, and you expect an array. Um, then the the magic hidden cache thing is one thing, but the uh, fusion itself also has the content cache, and the content cache seems to be uh, a difficult story for many and very misunderstood. But it's it's a cool device to very specifically uh, cache all your content. And uh, looking at all the at all the files I looked at, uh, it's a way too long story to to tell you in detail. Just keep in mind. Uh, you have three modes. You have cached, uncached, and dynamic cached. And um, if you cache something, it's really cached. It is in the cache. There is no changes. And everything that is rendered below the cached element uh, is not cached automatically. It depends on the mode, but it will uh, not change as long as not the parent entry changes because um, the way the cache works from the out inside out, uh, from the outside in. So. Um, Take care of that. Make sure that your cache uh, flushing, so the tagging of your entries is correct uh, to make that work. Um, for uncached, it's always uncached, so it's super slow, basically, uh, but it's uncached. So um, use it sparingly, but for something like a search or something, you might want to uncache it, because otherwise you will fill your cache up with strange entries and nothing will work. Um, so uh, dynamic cache is still halfway new, uh, and it's uh, specifically for cases where you have some dynamic parts in, in your cached stuff. So it will cache, and you can define a way how um, a new cache entry will be created from something from the environment. So usually uh, get variables or something um, might change uh, the way it is cached, so you can have a pagination. Every page, again, is cached in that. So that's pretty neat, but it takes a bit of getting 
to know and getting warm with that cache thing. But um, if you understand the principles, uh, how tags work, how an, ide an entry identifier works and the modes work, um, you're on a good track. And with a bit of experimentation, uh, if something doesn't work, boil down the example to very minimal example, just output some strings and see how it behaves. Um, it should work out. Um, then there's a node type versus prototype. Uh, also, uh, something that has a lot of confusion uh, in it. So usually you might be used to just uh, create a node type in node types YAML uh, and then have a template somewhere, maybe if you do it the super easy way and uh, your node is finished, um, everything is good. Um, but you have to keep in mind, uh, especially if you want to do more complex stuff at NEOS, that a node type is not bound to a prototype in Fusion and there is basically no relation. It's, it's super separated. Um, node types are just a configuration for something in the content repository uh, with a bit of additional stuff for the user interface, uh, but it tells you nothing about the rendering ac actually. Uh, it just has a name that can be referenced and a lot of properties, but there's, there's no notion of, of actual rendering of that stuff. Uh, then a prototype is just rendering. It expects some data and renders it. Um, there's actually now components, so you can separate that out and even uh, not depend on a node or something, but only low-level uh, data. So uh, those are two separate parts. You can define a lot of prototypes, a lot of node types. They don't need to do anything together. Um, but there's one automatic magic binding that we have, which is um, this. The red, uh, the red line. Um, we by, by default, if if we want to try to render a content element, we look at the nodes node type name, uh, which is obviously the name you configured in your node types YAML, uh, and we try to find a prototype with the same name and then use that for rendering. Uh, that's really just for ease of use, but it's the only connection between a node type and a prototype. Um, so you're free to do anything you like and separate that out. Uh, just keep it in mind. Um, it's actually a pretty powerful tool to create prototypes that don't belong to a node type. Uh, you can create a lot of nice components out of that and um, make your rendering really smooth. So yeah. Um, the prototype generator is something that is built in by default just to make your life easier. It generates prototypes based on your node type. Uh, that enables you, for example, to just drop a template somewhere after, after creating a node type in your node types YAML because the glue code, the fusion prototype that is found by using the node type name, as I showed you, um, is pre-generated by this prototype generator. That A, you can override, that's important. So you can change how for a specific node type the uh, fusion prototype is generated by default. Um, and you can just disable it and really do your uh, rendering fine-grained by hand without needing to uh, disable anything or override fusion that somewhere magically exists. Um, so that's also something to keep in mind. A node type doesn't need to have fusion code automatically. Um, then you have uh, nodes and flow query in PHP, also something many people don't realize. It works pretty well to work with flow queries in uh, PHP because you basically have the same syntax as um, in Fusion. So first you need a context, obviously, because without context you cannot have a node. Um, I'm just walking you through the steps pretty quickly. So um, you have a content factor, uh, context factory interface that you can inject into your code, wherever that is. So I expect you have somehow a context factory and you can just call the create method and it expects an array of, um, of parameters that define how the context looks like. So the workspace name, uh, dimensions, stuff like that. Um, and it in return, you get the context uh, with those specific um, parameters uh, from which then you can get the node. So these are the default context properties, just so, so you have seen them and know which keys are allowed for the uh, context properties. Uh, with this, you can create your own context uh, very specifically and say, okay, I need to uh, look at nodes in live context um, with those dimensions, and I also want to see uh, hidden nodes for whatever reason. 
So now you have a context, you need a node. You have two ways to do that. You can get a node by path. So you somewhere magically have a path. I don't know if you saved it in your database, you have it in your configuration, and you just ask the context for that node. Same goes for identifier. You have some node identifier that you pulled out from somewhere and um, ask the context for that node, and there you have your node. That's the prerequisite for using flow query. Now we actually use the flow query. So we expect to have a node here, um, and we create a new flow query. And on the flow query object, you can now call methods that exactly resemble what you do in Fusion and Eel. So um, you basically just use the same operations that you would use in Eel. The syntax is obviously PHP syntax, but uh, the results are exactly the same. Uh, so what I do is I take my node, um, look for children of uh, that are instances of f files file, and get them in the end because uh, the flow query operations always return a new flow query, so you can continue uh, building up a flow query. Uh, but in the end, you at some point want to call get to actually get the result of that operation. Right. Then that is all fine. You have, uh, you have fusion under control. Uh, next up, we found some strange incidents um, at uh, some routes out in the countryside. So routing is uh, a topic that is, again, very difficult, and I cannot go into details here. But uh, keep in mind that something, a concept called sub-requests exists, especially if you work with plugins. Um, they open a sub-request. So if you create a link in the plugin, um, it will behave as if in a sub-request. So um, it is different than creating a link, link on the top level in your Neos template. Uh, just keep in mind that this exists. There's also a use main request in the uh, link handlers, uh, link uh, view helpers. So um, uh, there is some trickiness in, in, in routing, but uh, also there's a lot of examples by now uh, in various uh, GitHub repositories in the core. Um, so look at that um, to really get uh, perfect routing uh, in your project. And then um, there is the um, the nasty government that uh, prescribes us a lot of policies. Um, so policies is obviously another topic that is pretty hard, and I cannot go into details. Uh, but again, there's a lot of examples in the Neos project and uh, people that are very helpful in Slack um, if you have problems with that. It's not an easy topic. We know it. Uh, the one thing that you need to remind that I, I tell everyone if they have problems with, with policies is abstain is a good thing. Unlike democracy, abstaining is, is a good thing in our security policies because um, that means you're all open for extension. Uh, someone else can decide if you still might get entry or not, but at this point abstain just means no. I cannot let you in. Uh, you might ask someone else. Because if you deny entry, that means the person that is denied cannot ask anyone else to let them in, uh, which means they will never get in anywhere else. So please keep that in mind. Abstain is nice. And then, uh, at last, there were some operations on, on Neos uh, that I saw grew some pictures of, and I won't share them because it's not, uh, not good for this audience, uh, I can tell you. Um, but um, you sometimes see um, very old Neoses, and you know, uh, they, they are not really, um, if you look into them and open them up, it's all kind of different and, and, and dusty, and, and it doesn't work right, and you, you wonder why some things don't work the way they are. And it's, it's basically all because of the version. So um, keep your Neos instances updated to a supported version, because otherwise uh, no one can help you. Um, it's, it's, it's really important to keep them updated. And we usually try to make the update process as smooth as possible. We provide a migration tool. And please use it. And then the final word that I heard, node repair is not a magic wand that repairs everything. Even though we try to make it that, uh, by now it's more like a Swiss uh, 70 tool multi thingy, and sometimes it has the right tool and it does the right thing, but 
it can also break stuff. So always be defensive with using note repair. Don't just think, ah, I will note repair and everything is better. Maybe it's worse after, because if it was bad before, it might just actually be, be worse. Um, use dry run. There's dry run that tells you exactly what it would change if you actually let it go on your database. Uh, do a backup and then do note repair. It, it will really help you probably, but um, don't, don't fear it, just make sure uh, you know the, the problem. And I, uh, I see I attracted some attention with my talk here. I think um, I might no longer be able to, to talk to you, but the truth is out there, so uh, please remember, use the NEOs, it's nice to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christian for the insights that you shared. So yeah, if you have any questions, I guess we have at least a minute or something. I yes, we do. Good. Does anyone have a question for a Christian? Anything? We want to throw this cool box around, so please, at least one question. Basti. Ooh. Ooh. I just wanted to catch this. <laughs> no, um, I, and I don't really have a question, just one comment to add. Yeah, um, I did something wrong, right? No, 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 no. I, I think you just forgot the oppor opportunity to mention one yeah. additional form of NEOs, and that's the mutated NEOs, <laughs> where people change the core code. <laughs> Don't ever do that. I have seen something like that, and I didn't recognize it at first, but yes, you are right. Yes, yes, mutated NEOs is pretty <laughs> dangerous. Um, Please, please handle with care and uh, make big red signs on it. And ideally, obviously, just don't do it. But yes, it's pretty dangerous to mutate a nails because you never know what comes out of it. I mean, it could bite you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Christian Müller.